So for my K, I did settler colonialism. There are three different versions of the K inside of the file for three different types of AFT, but uh, before we get into like the nitty gritty of that, let's start with the theory of settler colonialism and kind of background on it. Uh, so what is settler colonialism? It's when a group of people come to a new land and claim it as their own. They exploit the land and eliminate the natives. The goal is to increase the value of the land. Alongside this comes with the decrease of indigenous peoples on the land because they're what's holding back settlers from gaining more access to more land so they can create more value, make more money. That means that indigenous people are the thing that need to be gone in order for settlers to get what they want, land. Uh, settler colonialism versus colonialism. Settler colonialism lasts indefinitely unless there's settler decolonization or complete evacuation, but for our purposes, uh, it really only lasts indefinitely, which is what you have to know, because there's not going to be like settler decolonization in the real world or complete evacuation. Uh, colonialism, however, ends, which is when they leave the nations once they get what they want. And land is the key aspect of settler colonialism. Uh, in things like colonialism, it may be resources or minerals, but they're not actually there to take over the land itself. They're there for things that are on the land, but not necessarily to, like, live on the land. Um, genocide is a really important part of settler colonialism because it's the means through which settlers remove indigenous peoples, which, remember, are the only thing that are stopping them from getting the land. So there are three forms of genocide. First is physical genocide, which is the literal slaughter of Native Americans with something like the Trail of Tears. Then there is biological genocide, which is removal and relocation, so they aren't on their native lands. Then there's cultural genocide, which is the removal of their culture through different types of means. Uh, assimilation is a really big part of this. And I'll kind of explain these in the context of policies, which I'm going to go over right now. And quick side note, I'm going to spend a decent amount of time on history because I think the content can for the most part explain itself if you read it carefully, but uh, in history class it's not like we go over the Northwest Ordinance or whatever. So I think this is really important to be prepared for in CX and rebuttals when you need to give examples. Uh, the Northwest Ordinance isn't important, but I'm going to go over the important ones. Uh, in 1830, the Indian Removal Act. This is when the five civilized or quote-unquote civilized tribes were basically relocated. Uh, they were considered civilized because they had adopted the settler ways more than the other tribes. These five tribes were the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, and the Seminole. And the Indian Removal Act stated that the president could negotiate treaties and remove Indians and place them to the west of Mississippi. So they would remove eastern Indians. Uh, Jackson did this mainly, and he's the one best known for it, but Van Buren did a little bit of it, uh, or participated in the Indian Removal Act a little bit too. And those two presidents created one-sided treaties and relocated the Indians in what became known as the Trail of Tears. By the late 1840s, almost all Native Americans were relocated past Mississippi on the west side of it. Uh, 1860 to 1890 was the Plains Indian Wars. This is when Indians who lived on the plains battled white settlers who tried to push them onto reservations. This is something that you might have heard about in history, but in reference to specific battles. Like, the two big ones are, first, the Battle of Little Bighorn, which is where George uh, Custer and his 200-something-ish army were killed by the Sioux and the Cheyenne. Uh, so this was a victory for Native Americans. Then, the battle at Wounded Knee was when thousands of Cheyenne people were slaughtered, men, women, children, and this was the end of real armed resistance by indigenous people and what many consider the end of the Plains Indian Wars. It kind of shows how settlers were able to take over those. Uh, also, quick side note, both of those were I'd consider examples of physical genocide and probably the biological genocide in that the Trail of Tears and things like the Battle of Wounded Knee proved the physical extermination where you're literally killing people and that they wanted to relocate them onto different places. Um, 1879 to 1902, the federal government established about 150 plus boarding schools and the BIA, which is the Bureau of Indian Affairs, I'd get that down because I'm going to reference the BIA again. Um, 
Those recruiters from the BIA tried to convince parents to enroll their children in boarding schools where they had to wear settler clothes, get haircuts, not practice traditions. That is cultural genocide. Now, uh, this is a big deal and referenced a lot in the literature and something that you should probably know about if you don't right now. The 1887 Dawes Act, which is has like three components of it that we'll go over. First is that each Indian family head was allotted a 160-acre farm out of reservation lands. There are also other types of allotments, but I'm not going to go over those. Um, but just know that certain Indians would be allocated, or certain Indian families, not tribes, would be allocated a certain amount of acres. Uh, second is that a part of this act was the idea that if Indians were to abandon their tribal practices and culture for a more quote-unquote civilized lifestyle, uh, that would make you an American citizen. Third is that leftover reservation land got sold to white settlers. The goal of this act was really to transform Native Americans into farmers, which is why they were given a 160-acre farm out of reservation lands. Um, and Indians really lost big on this one. This was cultural genocide in that they many Indians ended up abandoning their practices in order to gain that American citizenship because... The Americans were, like, pretty brutal towards Indians. Uh, and then they also lost their land. So this is biological genocide. And I've read a few different numbers, but to give you an idea, they lost about 90 to 100 million acres. They lost about two-thirds of their land, seems to be the general consensus, in that they started with about 155 million acres and just lost a ton. Uh, next act, 1934 Indian Reorganization Act. The important part of this is the blood quantum, which went against Indian tradition, but first, what is the blood quantum? It's the idea that you have to have a certain amount of Indian blood in you to qualify as Native American and get the sort of benefits that Native Americans were getting at the time. But the purpose was really to dilute indigenous blood so there wouldn't be as many people on the land. And this worked in that if you were, like, it, it, it varied from, like, state to state, but if you had so much, like, Indian blood in you, I think, like, over half would probably qualify you to be Native American, but less than half, for example, would qualify you to not be Native American, um, which meant that only certain people would be considered indigenous, and that went against the tradition of adopting people into the tribe, no matter, like, whether they were one sixteenth, one fourth, half like me, but it predates to back around like 1705 in the colony of Virginia, but it wasn't as widely applied by the U.S. as a whole until the Indian Reorganization Act. Um, then this act is also something that people could bring up against you because what it did was it gave back land to Indians and somewhat increased their sovereignty. Um, because this guy inside of the, I think, CIA did a couple like nice things, but these gains all got rolled back essentially under the next policy I'll talk about, and Indians resented the sort of paternalistic policies of the BIA, which is the ones who gave back land to the Indians and stuff. And Native Americans argued that the idea of giving back land and, like, telling them how much land they can have and what kind of sovereignty they can have turned them into living museum exhibits, which is uh, terms that were used. Then, 1953 was the termination policy. This ended the BIA and its programs. It divided tribal property among tribes and forced them to pay taxes. It curtailed tribal self-government and relocated Indians to cities and ended welfare services for Indians. Uh, it terminated the tribal status of Indians, which is a key part, uh, or Indian groups, which meant that they would lose their sovereignty, end federal aid, like welfare, reservations were terminated and sold to non-Indians, Tribal members got subjected to U.S. taxes, basically what I said above, but the tribal status is a key part of this. Um, and from 1953 to about 1963, the government under this act terminated 109 tribes and probably removed around 2.5 million acres of, like, trust land, which was supposed to just not be touched at all by anyone. Um, 1956 was the Indian Relocation Act, which is the last act I'll talk about, uh, which is cultural genocide, uh, in that 
or uh, cultural and biological, I guess, but they, the American government paid for moving expenses of Native Americans, provided training and job placement to indigenous peoples willing to live their, uh, leave their reservation for nine government centers. They got terrible jobs, but the population was dispersed. That prevents things like coalitions. Uh, also means that they get assimilated into U.S. culture, have to leave the reservation, all of that. Then, the final thing I'm going to talk about is something that you all should have heard of, which is the Dakota Access Pipeline, really recent example of settler colonialism, where people are trying to just take over indigenous land uh, and wreck it. Um, so, the hashtag no DAPL movement is about the Dakota Access Pipeline, and that's referenced in, I think, at least one of the cards, um, in the AF front lines at least. Now, on to the Lynx General. Uh, this is the Frontline's general section, if you're going to follow along with the file. But, the Lynx General. So, we can make a version of the K about the state, but I decided not to do it on this assignment because that would probably be best as a topic-specific K, and I was only assigned the three versions of the K that I'm about to explain. The one link that I do have in the file is in case somebody is like, well, like, indigenous genocide really wasn't that bad. I don't know. I found the card and figured it'd be best to cut it in case somebody makes a ridiculous statement like that. Maybe if you're debating, like, I don't know, some kid reading Afropest and was like, well, like, indigenous people definitely, like, didn't have that much. Like, only black people suffered that much. Um, we'll see. Then, the impact is the more important start part about Frontline's general. Uh, first, you have the obvious genocide and mass violence impact, which should be explained above. Uh, if you didn't get it, you can text me privately, but it seems pretty self-explanatory. Second is Neolib. So, the nice thing about this card is that you get access to extinction level impacts like warming and get all that structural violence stuff and all the impacts that we know in like the regular neolib files. But the key part of the card is really explanation in order to be able to solve the impact using the alternative. The thesis of the card is that neoliberalism is derived from settler colonialism th or settler colonial thought processes. Exploitation is super obvious because the idea that, like, settler colonialism goes, exploits the land, you know, kills off native peoples, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, but the car thing the card really kind of emphasizes is the idea of surplus. So, with capitalism, surplus is, like, human surplus, with extra workers who become impoverished as a way to get rid of them. Because extra people laying around inside of, like, a factory and, well, it, it, extra people laying around in a factory who get paid is an obstruction to profit. So, populations get moved because they're extra and not needed. And so, genocide is enacted against those populations through tactics like poverty, which is basically what settler colonialism did. So, to solve this impact, you have to explain the alternative as a paradigm shift away from exploitation and surplus which would be Native Americans in the case of settler colonialism. They are the surplus, because they are the obstruction from gaining access to land. And once you rid the world of that psyche, that rids the world of neoliberalism. Um, these impacts, or sorry, the neoliberalism impact uh, probably work, or and the genocide impact, probably works only for the Afropest K and the Deleuze Pomo K, but not the Phil K. I just don't think the alternative would necessarily be able to solve it. If you disagree and know a way to spin it, then feel free to, but that's a personal opinion there. Um, moving on. Avropes. First, the links. Um, so, here's where I'd follow along with the file, because I'm going to reference the cards by name. This is an explanation of the Glenn and Daly cards. Uh, so, the main link is the idea that they have an inaccurate framing of the world. That means that settler colonialism is allowed to continue. So... Just like on how, uh, just like on in the historical historical materials in Cap K, you would run a link that's like X Y Z about the AF means they never acknowledge the role of capitalism, which ideologically reinforces capitalism. Blah blah blah. That is the same kind of deal as this K. So, they have an inaccurate frame for the world. Anti-blackness is their frame for the world, but indigenous oppression and anti-blackness serve the same structure of settler colonialism. Our frame of the world on the K is settler colonialism. Those are two distinct frames of the world and will come into play when I explain the alternative in answering the permutation. Um, <clears throat> so, anti-blackness is labor to exploit the indigenous people's land. They serve one end, and that is the end of the colonizers. 
It's not that indigenous people oppress black people or blacks oppress indigenous peoples, but both forms of discrimination work in tandem to create settler colonialism. And so a good example of a link is um, an idea that Wilderson writes about, which is junior partners. So the junior partners idea is that everybody is complicit in anti-blackness except for black people. So no matter whether you're like actual Indian from India, no matter whether you're Asian, no matter whether you're indigenous, that doesn't matter. You are a junior partner uh, as long like if you're as long as you're a minority that is not black. Um, white people are the masters. Everybody else, all of other minorities except for black people, are the junior partners. And that's a causal explanation because it's like indigenous people oppress black people. So uh, that's the one example of kind of like the causal link that we critique. Uh, they are mutually reinforcing and work together to create settler colonialism. And so the nice thing about these links is they also kind of function as a root cause claim that anti-blackness is created by the broader structure of settler colonialism and their ontology claims don't have any sort of power. Um, before I get to this Kaunani card, if you're not familiar with Afropess, I would suggest reading over your notes really quickly, maybe brushing up on ontology really fast, and uh, if you're not, then I'll continue. Um, so, I wouldn't classify this card much of a link as it is an ontology takeout and root cause claim. It could be spun as a link glow, which is why I put it here, but, you know, uh, anyways, I'll just keep going. This card is about how asserting race as ontological is really an assertion of what settler colonialism wants you to think. That is the link explanation. Um, and a better card would probably come out of this book by Wolf, which I'll cut a little later once I have time. But more important coming out of this card is one a root cause claim hidden in the card is the fact that in Chesapeake there were originally free African Americans who or Africans who were landowning and who could do what they want but settler colonialism kept expanding which required more and more labor and that is why slavery happened not because of some predetermined thing libidinal economy buzzword 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 but because of that settler capitalism as the card calls it the second claim is uh, a takeout to ontology that is important in the card. Um, so Bacon's Rebellion takes out ontology. Bacon's Rebellion was when whites and Africans who were indentured servants and slaves united and massacred Indian tribes. They went to the Okanichis, or, or I don't know how to pronounce it, Okanichis, and convinced them to capture warriors from the Skuskanhanak. And when they returned, they killed all those Indians. That's a denial of ontology because blacks exercise authority over another group. That collapses the entire theory of Afropest because it denies that sort of, uh, the, the claim that Wilderson and those other Afropessimist authors make that right when the Africans got off the boat, they were slaves and had no capacity for anything else um, other than just like working for white people and being like subjected to miserable conditions. So... This lack of, uh, like, like care almost, illustrated in Afropest mistrot proves why historical analysis is key. Otherwise, things get left out when you just do an ahistorical analysis, like Wilderson. Uh, I'm going to throw around those terms, synchronic and diachronic. Just kidding. Historical and ahistorical is the terms you should use. But, um, so we've discussed the root cause stuff. In the next two cards, I'm pretty simple on that, so I'm just going to go into the alternative. The alternative is a cartography of refusal, which is the exact term used in the card. But much more simply, all of this is just the idea that we have to destroy the settler colonial state and orient ourselves in such a way that we refuse its every action. And the nice thing about this card is that it's an answer to what I'm guessing Afro-pessimist teams might say, which is that indigenous politics is just liberal inclusion into the state, but it's actually a refusal. And it gives the example of the Canadian movement of Idle No More, which both Sexton and Wilderton critique. Idle No More isn't liberal inclusion. It directly negates the state in that they want to block resources and hurt the economy, which is the core of settler capitalism. So they directly take action antagonistically towards the state, um, which means that it is not the sort of liberal inclusion that Wilderton and Sexton critique. So. The destruction of the settler colonial state could sound similar to burn down civil society. But three things on the perm then. One, uh, their worldview is fundamentally distinct. This is a thing I said on the links. They see everything through anti-blackness, and we see everything through settler colonialism. Two, 
There's no fiat in K-only debates, so even if the alt and the F would hypothetically call for the same action, what K debates are really about is about how we view the world. Three is kind of related to two, is that there are no perms in methods debate. It's unfair because no two methods are mutually exclusive, so you get screwed just because you're the neg. Um, our friends at Wake Forest and their T-block call for rev v rev debates, which is exactly why you can't get perms. Because if they are both revs, then obviously they aren't mutually exclusive. Instead, it's a question of how we get to the revolution or how we view the world in order to get to the revolution. Um, the Phil K. Phil as in framework film, not philosophy like Pomo. And so this K is super similar to colorblindness. The idea is that settler colonialism is ingrained in Western culture, given that we live our everyday lives on lands that belong to indigenous peoples. The native culture of the U.S. is that of Native Americans, but instead, we came and eliminated any past culture of theirs in order to gain access to land. This means that you can't just put away settler colonialism and take a view from nowhere because it affects literally everything. A universalist philosophy doesn't work because indigenous people of the U.S. have tried to retain their culture, which is way different from the culture of Kant or Korsgaard advocates. Some tribes don't view themselves as individuals, for example. So, how could you try to re respect something like individual freedom in a place where there aren't individuals, but only a collective? If you don't understand the reference I just made to freedom, I'd brush up on your notes on Kant. So, the card even gives examples of when the imposition of freedom has been violent, like in the Middle East when cultures don't mesh, we just go in and basically kill a bunch of people or start a war. Um, that sort of imposition is violent when there are two different cultures at play. There's also a link to humanity, which is the second card uh, under the links for Phil, um, which is that indigenous people are considered subhumans, basically, which means that philosophy doesn't really apply to them. Uh, instead, it's like a philosophy for who claim, or like freedom for whom claim. Um, China just like brushes over indigenous people because they are like, well, we should give humans freedom. But like, really, like indigenous people are not like given the same amount of rights as um, like a white person. And finally, there's a link to liberalism, which is a third link. And it's just the idea that trying to incorporate indigenous peoples into the state through rights and concepts like justice is a form of settler colonialism by trying to assimilate indigenous peoples. Then the impact is pretty simple, just that insofar as settler colonial epistemology is in place, or settler colonialism worldview, or like any sort of settler colonialism, um, then the inferior are always going to be inferior and exploited, while the whites are the only ones that benefit, and their like philosophy or ethical orientation that the AF reads naturalizes the worldview of settler colonialism. The alternative is a place-based education, which is the idea that we need to acknowledge the lived experiences of people and basically just not make universal claims. This is mutually exclusive with philosophy. Philosophy is placeless in that it makes one overarching universalized claim and does not focus on the lived experiences of certain people. So the alt calls for theorizing about injustices in the real world and not trying to achieve some ideal justice or morality like a Kant framework might, which is basically the non-ideal versus ideal theory debate. The end is important because it says that settler colonialism is reproduced by normative habits, i.e. philosophy, which says that we ought to do X. The Pomo K. Um, I was really assigned to do to lose, but I cut two Pomo links as well. So I'll go over the Pomo links first. One, fluid identity. Uh, so fluid identity, quick recap, is something that postmodernists often advocate that we should like embrace subjectivity, embrace our free floating, not bound to anything or any structure identity, and like everything is unstable, our identity is unstable, we're constantly changing. But that doesn't work for Native Americans. Um, the first reason it doesn't is they're always battling for sovereignty or the ability to achieve that subjectivity in the first place. Second, it's a little bit harder, uh, or at least will require maybe more explanation here, but they're constantly struggling to keep their identity and battling settler colonialism to hold on to Native American heritage. They do certain essentialized things and take certain required actions, uh, i.e. they can't be free-floating, uh, in order to prevent white people from entirely taking over and eliminating their culture. The examples a card gives is how more and more people are classifying themselves as Native Americans to get into college, kind of diluting the Native American culture where anyone could just be Native American as long as they, like, you know, 
have maybe like one hundredth of blood or something, but it's not the blood quantum, it's more of the idea that like you're not like practicing the sort of Native American culture and the Native American way of life. Um, so Native American collectivities affect the subjectivities or uh, the kind of identities of people who live there and go there. Their subjectivity is shaped by the very reservation borders that exist as a result of settler colonialism. Settler colonialism from the get-go, because of the borders that it's created and the land it is dispossessed, has permanently marked indigenous people. Fluid identity only serves white people because they can become whatever they want, but Native Americans will always be marked as inferior, and they will always be affected by settler colonialism. That's kind of the key part that you have to get down about this, because as long as Native Americans are kind of marked by settler colonialism, they can't access that free-floating identity, which makes the alternative a prerequisite to doing the affirmative, and also proves that the affirmative's kind of method of going about and doing things is a bad it is bad because it would just reproduce the settler colonial structure um insofar as it doesn't acknowledge settler colonialism because it's like well everyone can be free but in reality no one's going to be free or no indigenous people would be free as long as settler colonialism exists the second link is discourse focus which is really simple it's just that focus on like things like discourse in postmodernism takes away from focus on materiality which takes away from focus on indigenous oppression uh, the Deleuze links. Um, two links here. First, the disembodiment or nomad links. Uh, in the card that I cut, there are kind of two concepts that you want to get down. One is the idea of disembodiment. Uh, it is basically the same kind of fluid identity concept I explained above, which allows a settler to do whatever they want. It means they can continue, uh, taking over and taking away Native lands while Native Americans are bound to what settler colonialism wants them to be and are always marked as inferior, just like the identity link above. So the idea of becoming, which is something in Deleuze, or the idea that we are constantly changing and are an amalgam or combination of differences that are constantly changing, like race, gender, sexuality, always being interpreted differently, uh, means that indigenous politics get marginalized and the European subject becomes the norm because only white people have the privilege of being fluid um, and not having their like race marked, whereas indigenous people are constantly marked with their race. They are seen as inferior because the structure of settler colonialism stays in place. Um, really quickly, I would also brush up on my Deleuze links because it's about to get a little bit more complicated, uh, especially after I get into stuff about rhizomes. Um, so the becoming stuff I just explained above, and I'm going to explain it a little bit below with rhizomatic politics, but probably want to brush up on it just a little bit. And the second part of the disembodiment links is the problem with Deleuze's nomadic subject is that the nomad is never held accountable to its action because it's constantly changing. So this means that they can be privileged and exploit others, and it wouldn't matter just like a little bit later because you can't locate the nomad because they're not the same person that they were like a year ago when they slaughtered a bunch of Native Americans. Um, the rhizome links, and th this is really what I meant when I want, like, you, you should go and brush up on your Deleuze links if you don't remember what rhizomatic politics is, if you can't define what an arborescent structure is. Um, I'll give you a quick definition, but it may be a little bit confusing if you don't understand the concept. Quick recap of Deleuze then. Right now, society operates through an arborescent structure or objective model. If you think of it like a tree, which is what an arborescent structure is, uh, there's an endpoint at the top where all the leaves are of the tree, and all individuals in society are the roots that lead to the single objective, which results in hierarchies. Some people are like either closer to the top of the tree, and some people are like, you know, kind of just working for other people. It results in those hierarchies. And the rhizome is what supposedly opposes the arborescent structure. So rhizomatic politics would entail not having a beginning or end goal, but extending infinitely in every direction and engaging creative social acts that destabilize hierarchies created by arborescent structures. Um, so, the rhizome is a link because it is literally settler colonialism. Then I'll kind of point out three different links that are seen inside of the cards, but one, the idea of extending infinitely in every direction like, settler colonialism sees no bounds and instead just conquers and conquers and, you know, spreads out in every direction across the U.S., takes over every indigenous land and keeps going. Um, 
Second is U.S. treaties were rhizomatic. They were created by individual settlers who each had different goals, profit, um, maybe they wanted like land, for example. Um, even if the overall structure of settler colonialism has the only goal of land, individual settlers may have different motivations, which result in the settler colonial policies of getting more and more land. Um, and that is kind of what structures the psyche of the settler, who may not necessarily know it. Uh, they may think they're doing it for profit, but in reality, they will eventually do it for land. Third is the lines of flight link, but I'm categorizing this under rhizomatic politics because I view the two as like intertwined. But um, again, brush up on your Deleuze notes, but lines of flight are connections that enable a movement from current social systems into something totally different. That's problematic because settlers would just move lands to escape the system and take over indigenous space. So lines of flight are what is basically an encouragement of settler colonialism. Um, I think the most common answer will be not my Deleuzean rhizomatics, I'm guessing, but the card is a nice little spiel about how embracing rhizomatic politics as a paradigm in general um, results in settler colonialism because like that's what the politics necessitates. Um, so, I think it also, the card also is like this pretty interesting example about the IDF in regards to smooth and striated spaces. I'm assuming you've already brushed up on your notes, but smooth spaces are spaces occupied by nomads and non state actors, according to DNG. And um, striated spaces are those occupied by the state institutions. So, in the IDF, they use terms like smooth out space, and they think of Palestine as striated because it is enclosed and borders with fences and everything. Um, as you can see, it justifies that, like, violence in imperialist politics. Um, and they themselves, as the IDF, aren't necessarily acting within the state. The founding of Migrant, for example, uh, I feel like I'm pronouncing it wrong, maybe Migron, but, uh, was not originally something the state advocated because it's illegal, but, um, eventually the state incorporated it in other West Bank settlements into Israel. I think this is interesting, but they even refer in the IDF to, like, the Deleuzean swarm. It's just, like, so weird to think that they actually, like, cite Deleuze. This was an interview with an IDF officer. Um, so, anyways, frontiers aren't rigid and fixed, so frontiers are the perfect place for rhizomatic politics. Their best response would be Deleuzean rhizomatic politics accounts for things like settler colonialism, because insofar as the end goal is settler colonialism, that means it's arborescent. However... The Marlowe card says this at the end in that there are many and that there are multiple structures that feed into settler colonialism so that all the little rhizomes may unknowingly feed into that structure. It isn't the overarching goal of the rhizomes because they don't have a goal, but it is a side effect. Um, whether it's consciously or unconsciously, they all feed into settler colonialist politics. The alternative is red pedagogy, which is a term created by Sandy Grand. Um, which just means theorizing from an indigenous standpoint, just like the tagline says. So it's the idea that we need to start from the viewpoint of the Native of Native Americans and see what they have to say. Um, I, th I don't know if you need so much of an explanation of the alternative as much as why it solves the link, so I'm going to go through that. It solves the identity link, obviously, because it's grounded in Native theorization, so it like doesn't fall into the trap of erasing indigenous experience or assuming indigenous experience doesn't matter. And it solves the rhizome links, I would say, because a Native American view of the world would acknowledge the inherently colonizing effect of the rhizome and expose how like the fluidity and mobility of the rhizome is a really bad thing and something that Native Americans cannot access. Um, now we'll move on to the AF answers. But before I do that, uh, if any of you are confused on any of those three Ks or any parts of the three Ks, um, or have questions about, like, strategy or something like that, feel free to Slack or text me. Uh, I have answers. So, I didn't cut answers cut about, like, Deleuze or anything, because we didn't really read Deleuze apps, but I cut answers of the Ks that were most likely to hit, and at least, like, a K that I think I've hit one time. Um, people are really bad at reading Settler Colonialism, just a quick side note, but if you do hit a K, the K will be like, the AF uses the state, and that is Settler Colonialist. Done. Yeah. Uh, so I cut a bunch of cards on why, like, engaging the state is good and engaging the law is good. Uh, I'll go over those. Go to each of the blocks. Most of the, most of the cards under the Engage the Law 
uh, have similar theses, but like there are three different categories that I've added it in. So the cards under engage the law good all functionally say that Native Americans should engage the law because it helps their movement movements. Uh, there are a few reasons why. One, it addresses the question of sovereignty, which is really important for Native American politics. Um, because it gives them like control over their land and control over their politics and everything. Second is that property rights are part of indigenous culture and are really important uh, to indigenous movements. Um, property rights obviously can only be accessed through law. Third is engaging the political is especially key in the age of Trump, which means that we have to start engaging the law, questioning the law, um, reclaim the political. Now, under the state good, uh, the card is basically Zanotti, which is like, we need to use the master tools, otherwise they will have an advantage over us, and we won't be able to counter them, and they'll be too powerful. Um, so learning about the state is good, the heuristic argument you want to make, um, and this doesn't necessarily require you being like, we have to like, always engage the law, rather, the argument of the AF would then just be like, talking about the law is a good thing, even if none of us become policymakers, it is, it, is, it is a useful thing for us as activists to talk about the law, um, and those could also be coupled with, like, certain framework arguments that you want to make, so if they're making, like, real-world education arguments, um, or activism arguments or something like that, you want to kind of turn that on them and be like, no, but we are the ones who are the best activists because we use the master's tools. Um, the perm cards. They're both basically law goods, or they're, sorry, not both, there are three of them. Um, they're all law good for the reasons of, one, the first card is, like, it results in the most accurate analysis of reality by directly referring to states, because states are at the intersection of many different ideologies, which are all, like, united around settler colonialism, so, like, capitalism, racism, etc., and if we, if we don't acknowledge kind of the state and how the state works, that analysis wouldn't end up happening where, like, we wouldn't, like, look at the ways that capitalism, racism, um, all those different kind of things from the state play into settler colonialism. Instead, we'd just be like, settler colonialism is a broad theory and ignore all the other different factors that go into it. Um, second card is that not challenging and engaging the law. Uh, not challenging or not, cha not engaging the law is the same thing as staying silent on issues of law which is the tactic of settler colonialism, so that we ignore issues of racism and dispossession. Uh, only through engagement with the law can settler colonial tendencies be exposed, um, which is a net benefit to the perm and proves a disad to the alternative alone. Uh, third is that engaging the law in questioning the law collapses it on itself by exposing contradictions, like, why don't indigenous people have certain rights? Like, what makes them so different from us? Like, why are they on reservations? Why have we put them on reservations? Why are there certain things that, uh, I, like, I already addressed that, but um, that kind of question. But the Bander card refers to it as rupture, which is essentially exploding the law. And the net benefit to it is that there is no risk of co-option by the state because all forms of law are then determined illegitimate through a strategy of rupture, whereas the alternative alone would not necessarily result in that same type of rupture. And Finally, the Indigenous Appropriation card. Well, for Spencer Paul, it is the Evans card for settler colonialism, except written by an actual author and, like, not some debater on a blog. So, any non-Indigenous person who is reading the settler colonialism K, you can critique and be like, you are appropriating Indigenous politics. You are the problem. Um, that's it. I really like this K, so I'll be cutting more front lines, like, answers to Indigenous appropriation, and, like, answers to common answers Afro-pessimist debaters will make, and versions of the NC, like, for answering queer pest and fem rage that uh, you'll add to your file. I'm not sure when I'll get around to those, but I think it's a really great K, and I hope you like it, too.